Hi, I'm Dr. Chris Masterjohn of chrismasterjohnphd.com, and you're watching Masterclass with Masterjohn. And today is the second in a series of lessons on the system of energy metabolism. The ketogenic diet has neurological benefits. Why do we have to eat such an enormous amount of food? Science, clear explanations. Class is starting now. In the first lesson, we talked about how the second law of thermodynamics creates a situation in which the universe is ever tending towards greater disorder, but also that any given system in the universe itself tends towards greater and greater disorder unless there's some energy invested into that system. And to illustrate this, we showed this slide that's currently on the screen. And we talked about how our rooms will become a mess if we don't invest energy into cleaning them. But there's a problem with this. In some sense, it's a metaphor, but it's literal in the sense that everything in this picture, like everything else in the universe, is subject to the second law of thermodynamics. And so we can look at the picture on the left and see the messy room, but not everything's a mess. There's a lot of order in that room. Look at the structure of the bookshelves and the drawers. Why don't they break? Why doesn't everything in the room disintegrate and randomly distribute itself through the universe in order to maximize its disorder or its entropy? The reason is that even though everything tends towards greater and greater disorder in the absence of a sustained energy input, it's also the case that everything has its own resistance to change. The resistance to change is the activation energy. Consider, for example, a piece of wood shown on the screen that's being karate chopped. Before the chop, it's high in the air. After the chop, it's low, it falls to the ground. Between those two positions, it goes from high to low according to the force of gravity. That releases energy and the wood, when it's on the ground, is in a lower energy state than it was when it was higher up. How did it get to that lower energy state? Energy had to be added through the karate chop. So even though it's going to a lower energy state, some amount of energy input first has to be infused into this situation in order to allow the wood to overcome its own resistance to change. We can think of some examples as metaphors in our own life. Let's imagine that we're at work or we're at school and we're really tired and we would love to be home in our beds, lying there doing nothing, relaxing, we want to go from a higher energy state to a lower energy state. Getting home and resting in the bed is that low energy state. But our problem is that we need to get from work or from school to home. How's that going to happen? Well, we're going to have to invest energy to walking to our car and or walking to the subway or however it is we get home. That amount of energy that we need to expend to just be able to get to the resting state we want to be in is like the activation energy. For a chemical reaction, the activation energy is the energy that you need to power through the transition state. In any reaction, you start with reactants and you wind up with products. In this generic cartoonified reaction, we have a blue molecule that's reacting with a red molecule in order to produce two molecules that are both red and blue. For that to happen, they're going to need to bind together and swap the red and blue places. And when they're bound together, that's a highly unstable, high energy transition state. 
The diagram on the bottom plots how the free energy would change in this reaction. You can see that the reactants have more free energy than the products. Since energy is being released, the delta G for this reaction is negative. The free energy of the products minus the free energy of the reactants is going to equal the delta G of the overall reaction shown there. In order to get from reactants to products, you have to go through the high energy transition state. And the amount of energy that you need to invest over and above the energy of the reactants to get through that transition state is the E sub A, or the activation energy. Catalysts speed up reactions by decreasing the activation energy. And enzymes are a specific category of biological catalysts. What they do in our bodies is reduce activation energies by facilitating an alternative lower energy transition state. So they grab onto these molecules and say, hey, it's better if you do it this way. That'll make it happen more efficiently. So you can see on the screen the red line represents the progress of an uncatalyzed reaction. The green line represents the exact same reaction, but it's catalyzed by an enzyme. And the enzyme catalyzed reaction has a lower activation energy barrier than the uncatalyzed reaction. And that's going to help that reaction go forward more easily. If it goes forward more easily, it'll happen faster and at a more meaningful rate. But enzymes aren't the only thing that's going to affect the rate of a chemical reaction. In order for these molecules to react, they're going to have to collide in the right orientation and with sufficient energy to get through the transition state. If they collide in the wrong orientation, they just bounce off one another and nothing happens. They stay the same. If they collide maybe in the right orientation, but they're just not moving with enough energy, man, that's weak. Nothing happens. But if they collide in the right orientation with sufficient energy, they get through the transition state and the reaction happens. Now, we can also get a reaction happening just by adding a greater concentration of reactants. So what's shown over here in the lower right is that if you take that same reaction and you just double the number of reactants, you're going to get twice as many reaction reactions happening at the same time, and the reactions therefore going to happen at twice the rate. Now, for simplicity, it's just shown two of each of these molecules. But we can imagine that there are many, many, many more than that in any given solution. And so it would actually be the case that we don't have to add more of both. If we have a lot of red and a lot of blue, and we just add more red, even that alone will make the reaction go forward faster because the likelihood that a red and a blue molecule will collide together is going to be higher if there's more red or more blue. If you add both, the probability that they'll collide together is even higher. So there's a few strategies that can be used to increase the rate of a chemical reaction. If one of the problems is colliding but not with enough energy, then there's two ways around that. One is you increase the amount of energy. That's what the karate chop did. That's what we would do if we're going to cook our food and add heat in order to speed up the chemical reactions in the food. And that's what happens when we have a fever where we have an increase in our body temperature that adds energy to the system and makes chemical reactions happen faster. The other way around that is what enzymes do, which is to reduce the amount of energy you need so that the amount of energy that you already have is enough. Another strategy would just be to increase the concentration of the reactants. That will give you faster chemical reactions. If we go back to our analogy at the beginning, where we want to go home and rest in our bed in our low energy state, but we're too tired to invest the energy to get from point A to point B, then we can make analogies across the board here. So adding energy to the system would be like drinking a cup of coffee. 
Suddenly you've perked up, you can make it to the bus, you can make it to your car, the subway, whatever. What an enzyme is doing is providing an alternative transition state that's lower in energy. That would be like you call an Uber or your friend offers you a ride. You have the same amount of energy you had before, but suddenly someone's made it easier. Increasing the concentration in that analogy would be like saying at a population level, if let's say we're kind of a crafty politician and we want to show that we're improving the public transportation in the city. If we're crafty enough, we could just get a lot of people to move to the city and everyone's just as tired. It's just as hard to get from point A to point B, but we could show that a lot more people are getting from point A to point B and that would be like increasing the concentration of the reactants. In any given solution of say one chemical at a constant temperature, the temperature reflects the average amount of energy in that solution, but the molecules in that solution are all going to have different energies. And we could describe them as a population of molecules where a certain trait, the amount of energy they're moving around with, has a distribution. Just like we could say in a population of people, we could pick any kind of physical trait or mental trait, personality trait, whatever, and it's going to vary in a distribution. Some people are going to have more, some people are going to have less. So what's shown on the screen is a generic description of a population of molecules. As you go rightward, these are molecules that are moving around with a greater amount of kinetic energy. As you go upward, you have more and more molecules. So you have some average amount of energy, and it's really easy to look at the distribution and plot the mode. The mode is the amount of energy where the most number of molecules are represented. And let's say that this is a molecule that exists in our body that's going to undergo a particular chemical reaction we could say that the activation energy barrier for that reaction is represented by this red line. If that's the case, the number of molecules that are able to react on their own is right up here in the tail of the distribution after that red line. So this is broadly representative of the types of reactions that happen in our body, most of which have activation energy barriers that are sufficiently high that there's only this tiny number of molecules that's moving around with enough energy to undergo that reaction in the absence of enzymatic catalysis. Now let's say an enzyme comes into play and moves the activation energy barrier from the red line to the green line. What that enzyme has done is acted on this same population of molecules with the exact same distribution of kinetic energy but it's lowered the bar and now suddenly the number of molecules that can react has massively increased. If you look at how many times does this little tiny uh, area under the curve in the tail, how many times does it fit into this? I don't know, 10, 15, 20? I can't really eyeball it myself, but it's a lot. That's a massive increase. If you had an enzyme that reduced the activation energy even further, let's say to this green line over here, now suddenly you have this utterly massive increase in the proportion of molecules that have sufficient energy to react. And what that means is that in proportion to the degree to which you've lowered the activation energy barrier, you're making that reaction go faster. You're increasing the rate because per unit time, the whatever number of molecules collide are going to be more likely to collide with sufficient energy to react. Now, this doesn't just allow enzymes to speed up reactions. It also allows them to control which reactions will take place. And that allows our physiology to regulate enzymes and thereby control what does and doesn't happen in our bodies. Shown on the screen, are two reactions A and B. And you can see that both of these reactions have activation energy barriers that are way above body heat. 
So very few molecules in either of these reactions are going to go forward. But A has a smaller delta G than B does. Both of them are energetically favorable because the delta G is negative. But B is more energetically favorable than A because the magnitude of the negative delta G is much larger. So even though neither of these reactions will go forward very fast, B is a lot more likely. So even though neither of these reactions will go forward at a very rapid rate, to the extent either of them goes forward, B is a lot more likely to go forward than A simply because it's more energetically favorable. But let's say that we have an enzyme that catalyzes A and we don't have an enzyme that catalyzes B. Then the fact that B is more energetically favorable than A becomes totally irrelevant because only A has been catalyzed to the point where its activation energy barrier is below the energy that body heat provides. Now where this really becomes important is when one molecule can have multiple chemical fates. Let's suppose that molecule A could be converted to X, to Y, or to Z. The free energy is plotted on the vertical axis so you can see that A being converted to X is very energetically favorable. A being converted to Y isn't as energetically favorable, but it's still energetically favorable. A being converted to Z is energetically unfavorable because the delta G is positive. Now, if we just left this up to what would happen spontaneously, a would tend to get converted to X. Well, what if you need A to be converted to Z or to Y? The way that you can make that happen is an enzyme can catalyze the conversion of A to Y. And suddenly it doesn't matter that A to X is more energetically favorable. Now you're making A to Y happen. If you wanted A to be converted to Z, you'd have to couple it to one of these other reactions to supply the energy needed for that to happen. Now this allows precise control over everything that happens in the body. Because if body heat per is not sufficient for most reactions to go forward, then enzymatic catalysis is the thing that's controlling which reactions take place. And enzymes can then be regulated. They can be turned on or off. They can be switched up or down. They can be put into some locations, but not others. Or we can compartmentalize things and say, okay, in this compartment, we're going to convert A to Z, but in that compartment, we're going to convert A to X. And that allows the body to make sure that all its needs are met. To take just one example, most compounds in the body are based on carbon. And there's two fundamental building blocks that make up all those molecules. There's two carbon units called acetyl groups, and there's one carbon unit called methyl groups. The basic building block we're gonna use most of the time to build a molecule is an acetyl group, the two carbon unit, but on an as-needed basis, we may add or subtract methyl groups as well. Well, that means that we can have this one thing, a two carbon unit called an acetyl group, that could be made into a fatty acid. It could be made into cholesterol. It could be made into vitamin D. It could be made into so many things, hormones. If that one thing can have so many metabolic fates, then we need to be able to have this precise control. And the mechanism of enzymes allows us to have that level of control that we need. So how do we regulate our enzymes? Well, there's a lot of ways, but we can break them down roughly into three categories. Non-covalent modifications are weak bonds that take effect immediately. Covalent modifications involve strong bonds, and they can be immediate, but they can take up to minutes to take place. And changes in gene expression are changing the number of proteins that you make using the information in your DNA, 
and these can take hours to days, sometimes even longer. So let's go through a couple examples of each and talk about why there's this difference in the time course and also why is it important to have so many different ways to regulate the enzymes. One example of a non-covalent modification would be competitive inhibition of an enzyme. You can see that an enzyme binds to the substrate at what's called the active site and then it catalyzes the reaction and releases the products. But if something else binds to the active site, it will block the substrate. The substrate can't get in and the reaction doesn't take place. Another type of non-covalent modification is called allosteric regulation. The word allosteric means that something is binding to some site on the enzyme that isn't the active site. And allo means other. Steric refers to the spatial arrangement of atoms. And so allo other means other than the active site. So you see the same diagram of an enzymatic catalysis happening on the top as we saw in the last slide. But in allosteric inhibition, an inhibitor could bind to some other site. And that binding to that other site causes a change in the shape of the active site and the substrate is not able to fit into the active site. The reaction doesn't take place. We could just as easily have a case of allosteric activation by if something bound to some other site on the enzyme, it could change the shape of the active site in a way that makes it easier for the substrate to bind. That would activate the enzyme and make it work better. In later lessons, we'll look at specific examples of allosteric regulation. And one of the things that we'll notice is that usually the things that are doing the regulation are either substrates in the pathway, products in the pathway, or something very nearby the pathway. And because it's being mediated by things that are in the immediate proximity of the pathway, that's why the effects will take place immediately. And one of the advantages of this is that it allows the pathway to respond very quickly to things that are happening in the local environment. Let's say that you're an enzyme and your job is to get product X produced. Well, maybe product X is going to inhibit you. And what that does is allow you to say, okay, I've produced enough product X, now I can shut down my activity. One of the most well-known examples of a covalent modification is phosphorylation. And phosphorylation is part of how insulin mediates many of its effects. What's shown on the screen is a very generic illustration. This is not the exact mechanisms, but it's just demonstrating the basic principle. So insulin is going to be made by the pancreas. It's going to travel through the blood to some insulin sensitive cell, and it's going to bind to the insulin receptor. That's going to produce a cascade of reactions inside the cell where there are repeated phosphorylations in sequence. And an enzyme that phosphorylates something is called a kinase. It takes the energy of ATP and the terminal phosphate bond of ATP and sticks it on something else. And you can have an inactive kinase that's activated by being phosphorylated by the insulin receptor, and then it is going to phosphorylate some other kinase, and it becomes active, and that kinase phosphorylates another one, and so on, until ultimately you phosphorylate a protein, make it go from the inactive state to the active state, and that is gonna carry out a cellular response. Well, part of the reason this is gonna take minutes is because that insulin came from your pancreas. So you eat food, and then food molecules make their way to the pancreas, the pancreas makes insulin, the insulin has to travel to the relevant tissue, and then once it gets there, it needs to carry out this cascade of events, and that also takes some time. And so all of these things that need to happen reflect why it can take a few minutes for this to kick into action. Although this takes a bit longer than the mechanisms that we looked at earlier,
One of the advantages is that this allows the cell to respond not only to its own internal environment, but also to signals of what the rest of the body needs, which is what insulin is communicating in this example. And although the pathway looks complicated, what it actually allows is fine-tuned control of the pathway. There may be multiple different responses that are mediated by effects of different kinases in the cascade, and there may be one typical standard response to insulin, but depending on the cell's own needs and abilities, it may wind down part of the response to insulin, but keep another part of the response to insulin active. And so having such a complicated pathway is basically just allowing the cell multiple different nodes of control over what it's doing and how it's responding to the needs of the body. As an example of changing gene expression, we could have the hormone leptin. Leptin is made by our adipose tissue. It acts on multiple tissues, but especially the hypothalamus in our brain to regulate our food intake and our energy expenditure in response to the amount of body fat that we have. Leptin binds to a receptor on the cell surface, and then that receptor activates certain transcription factors. Transcription factors are proteins that travel to the nucleus where they bind to DNA and alter the expression of genes. That means that if a gene codes for a certain protein, a transcription factor could make that gene make more of that protein or less of that protein. And then as you change the number of proteins, then that alteration in the number of proteins is going to carry out some kind of physiological response. Now, gene expression takes the longest. Well, why would that be? Well, if we compare it to phosphorylation mediated by insulin, there's a lot of similarities. We have the hormone that needs to be made in one tissue travel through the circulation to another. It needs to bind to a cell surface receptor and initiate some cascade of events that happen inside the cell. All that's the same, but there's something that adds a lot of time to this. And that is that instead of altering the activity of proteins that already exist, you're altering the number of proteins that exist, but you're doing it indirectly by changing the rate of production. And it takes time for a change in the rate of production to translate into a change in the total number of the proteins. Let's take a very generic example where the math has been made unrealistically simple. Let's say that you have 100 enzymes in a cell of some particular type of enzyme. You, although you always have 100, each day you're making 10 and you're also degrading 10. Well, let's say you want to alter gene expression to result in a 10% increase in the number of proteins. If you increase gene expression by 10%, you are now producing 11 enzymes instead of 10. If you make 11 enzymes each day and you degrade 10 enzymes each day, then the number of enzymes in the cell is increasing by one per day. So on day one, you now have 101 instead of 100. On day two, you have 102 enzymes. On day three, you have 103 enzymes. And then it's going to take all the way to day 10 to get 110. So it took 10 days for your 10% increase in enzyme production to result in a 10% increase in the total number of enzymes available in the cell. So again, that's unrealistically simple math, but it demonstrates the point about how it's going to take quite a bit of time for a change in gene expression to result in a proportional change in the number of proteins, which is what's mediating the physiological response. If it takes so long, why would we do it? Why don't we just take the pool of enzymes that we have and turn them on and off? Well, basically, it's achieving two things. One of them is it's amplifying the response that you can get through the other modes of regulating enzyme activity. If you have a hundred enzymes and you turn them all on, 
your maximal response is 100. If you have 200 enzymes and you turn them all on with phosphorylation, you're getting twice the response out of the phosphorylation that you were getting otherwise because you have a lot more to work with. But also if you have more of them, that gives you finer tuned control. You don't have to have all of the enzymes activated at once, and if you have more enzymes to work with, you have more, con more precise control over how many you have active. Now that we've laid down the basics of energy and enzymes, we can begin talking about the biochemical pathways that enzymes catalyze, and now we'll be able to ask questions like, when we eat food, what happens to it? What do we do with that energy? And does it matter what type of food we eat? Does that impact how we metabolize the energy that we get from it? We'll be looking at those in future lessons. If you'd like further reading, as I mentioned in the last lesson, I highly recommend the chapter Catalysis and the Use of Energy by Cells from Molecular Biology of the Cell. The fourth edition, which is an older edition, is available for free on NCBI Bookshelf. And you can see that on the screen, but I've made a convenient shortcut to get to it with chrismasterjohnphd.com slash energy. The audio of this lesson was generously enhanced and post-processed by Bob Devodian of Torian Mixing, giving you strong sound and dependable quality. You can find more of his work at torianonlinemixing.com. All right, I hope you enjoyed this lesson. Signing off, this is Chris Masterjohn of chrismasterjohnphd.com. You've been watching Masterclass with Masterjohn, and I will see you in the next lesson.